Thank you all. It's great to see everybody. And uh, I don't get to see, say this very, but live from New York. That's, that's where I am. I am uh, coming to you from New York City. The lovely sunset behind me was actually taken from my office. That's a picture I took a couple of years ago from my office at NYU. It's not quite so beautiful out there today, and, uh, but I'm still happy to be a proud New Yorker and really glad to be here with all of you today. We have a phenomenal panel of speakers. And uh, rather than me read you their bios, I'm gonna kind of go down the list and let my guests spend a minute or two telling you about themselves and then we'll dig right into it. So Ian, I see you up there in my corner. Why don't you dive in first, Ian Temple. Hi, I'm Ian Temple. Can everyone, can you hear me? It's working. Excellent. Uh, so I'm Ian Temple. I'm the founder of Soundfly. Um, we are an online music school um, doing some, some, some stuff a little bit differently. Uh, we have uh, a ton of video uh, and tutorial courses and stuff like that, but we also connect people for in-depth one-on-one mentorship sessions. And so that's, that's really where... Uh, where my passion lies is in connecting people um, via online tools for deeper learning experiences. That's what I'm here for. Well, you know that, that Brian Wilson's album, I Just Wasn't Made for These Times? I think you were made for these times. <laughs> so uh, so True. welcome. Okay, Robin, I see you. Tell us about yourself. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Robin Rumors. Uh, I'm a mixing and mastering engineer. Uh, recently moved from, from Europe to Miami. Uh, I'm also a software developer. Uh, I have a software company called Big Wing Audio, where we develop software for mixing and mastering. And uh, besides that, I'm also director of education for Abbey Road Institute here in Miami, which we just launched. And yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Okay. And we have the fabulous music educator, Mickey Smith, Jr. Hi, Mickey. You have to unmute yourself. Three. Oh. Should. There you are. Okay. All right. I don't know what I did. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thanks again for having me. Uh, again, my name is Mickey Smith Jr. And uh, it's, it's been quite, quite a busy season despite the COVID rest. Uh, I'm currently serving as music educator, uh, band director at Maplewood Middle School, which is in Southwest Louisiana. Uh, recently was awarded the Music uh, Education Award by the Grammys. Uh, in incredibly grateful for that wonderful experience. Uh, and in addition to that, I've recently been named an ambassador by First Lady Donna Bell Edwards for her Teach Music, Art, and Movement initiative. They call it Teach Ma'am. And uh, I also serve as the president for Music Makers Tea, which is a nonprofit that encourages our local community here to dust off and donate instruments and then we take those instruments and put them in the, the hands of deserving young people. Um, and when I'm not doing all that, as well as being a freelance musician, saxophonist, I also serve the needs of educators with a program I started called Sound 180, where we basically give teachers the, 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 the empowerment, the, the resources, the tools, the techniques they need to teach in a way where they create a sound 180 days of classroom instruction and harmony. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited about the potential that's coming with this new opportunity. And that's how I view this as an opportunity to, uh, to just change the paradigm of, of education, specifically music education. So thank you all again. That's great. And I'm gonna take the liberty of pointing out that Mickey is being unduly humble here. As, as Melissa said, I, I serve on the Board of Governors for the Recording Academy here in New York. And I see some of my other Recording Academy colleagues, Maureen Droney, who heads the P&E Wing and Reed Wick from New Orleans, and as they will attest, the competition for the Music Educator Award is fierce and huge. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of nominations that are submitted every year, and the process goes over the course of months where we have an unbelievable array of music educators. So to finally arrive at one is no small feat. So the fact that Mickey won that award really says a lot about you. So congratulations. So Thank one you. more, um, Sean, where are you? Yes, indeed, here I am. There so you are. 
<laughs> Sean R. Dwam, a two-time Grammy-nominated artist, also serving on the Memphis chapter board, ending up my second term. Um, I'm a Creole rock and soul artist, created my uh, new genre so that I could express my musicality on a bigger scale. Want to get people involved in my music, my, my her heritage music, which is Zydeco and Creole music, but I want to make it accessible to all people. I also do communications facilitation and I also um, coach people. And I'm just, you know, learning this whole streaming environment because I do realize that whenever we get back to the new normal, everyone who has a good grasp, a firm grasp of how to make money in this landscape will have that stream because this stream is not going to go away. That's right. That's right. Sean also, everyone here is very modest. Sean is, comes from a, a royalty in New Orleans musical family. So we are very, very happy to have you. And just a quick word about myself. As Melissa said, I'm an entertainment lawyer specializing in music. I've been in private practice for a long time. That probably accounts for the gray hair. I also have the honor of teaching in the music business program at New York University here in New York. And I started out as a musician Myself, I sing and write and play percussion. I tour pretty regularly with my clients, The Four Tops, on percussion, and I often refer to that as the ultimate attorney-client privilege. So whatever I do in music, whether as an attorney or an educator, it all stems from, from my passion for music and my belief that music makes the world better. And I've seen a lot of conversation online in the past couple of months of the pandemic, where people are reaching out to various sources, whether it's Spotify or Apple Music or Netflix, the arts are one of the main tools that people both within and beyond our community are using to get through. There's some meme going around saying, oh, you wanna decrease funding to the arts? How would you have gotten through the pandemic without Spotify and Netflix, right? So I think pretty much by definition, everybody that's here in this conversation is aware of this, but it bears repeating that the arts and music in particular are absolutely critical in general, but certainly in times like this. So Ian, I wanna start with you. I'd like you to elaborate a little bit about the tools that you've used, how they worked pre-pandemic and what you're doing in these times to try and reach people and help people and get people through. Uh, yeah, um, so, uh, I, so the whole idea and concept behind what we're doing with Soundfly is that a lot of, um, a lot of people, you know, when, when kind of online courses took off 10 years ago or whatever massive open online courses everyone thought it would be the savior of education as we know it and blah 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 you know oh you anyone can just take a harvard course online forever and like yeah education's fixed and we all know that that's just not the case that's not the way it works and and so a lot of what we're we're out to do with soundfly is 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 about kind of taking that next step and and saying yeah there okay so now there's a lot of content available now you can learn stuff from anyone anywhere um but how do we how do we do more with that and, and you know the mentorship program we we put forward um is one of the ways that we're helping people kind of get more out of online education and stuff like that um uh so, so that's kind of our perspective coming into this um the the i think what's been interesting is is with the whole covid 19 thing is that suddenly everyone's going to online education everyone's going to these these online courses and stuff like that and and uh and experiencing really you know serious difficulties it's hard to learn stuff online it's hard especially for for kind of elementary school middle school stuff um you know i have small kids myself and they're doing like zoom calls with their preschool classes and it's just like this is, ah, uh, um, you know, and, and teachers are not necessarily, you know, are doing heroic stuff. And I've seen some really amazing resource sharing among teachers around how to use online tools better. But it's funny how often teachers just get dropped in and it's like, oh, here, use this online tool. And it's like, well, how, what does that mean? Like, I don't know, like, sure, I can assign it to my kids, but they don't actually watch it. They don't actually get anything from it. They, you know, so I think, we're just seeing, we're seeing a lot of, you know, a lot of online content being digested right now, obviously, like our traffic is way up, our, you know, uh, every, everything, our video views are way up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think a lot of 
who take education really seriously and are trying to actually make improvements um, are, are also struggling with how do we use these tools effectively. And, and, and that's one of the things that I'm really curious about and interested in supporting if, if we can. Great, great. How about you, Mickey? I know you're a hands-on teacher as well as this greater role that you've taken on within the Recording Academy and the other projects you're involved with. Tell us a little bit more about what your world looked like before everything turned upside down and how you've been adapting and what you think would be useful tools going forward. Sure, thank you, Judy. Um, you know, before the COVID, uh, I believe that modern day teaching was relationship-based teaching. I believe that wholeheartedly. Uh, in the essence that kids don't really care how much you know until they know first that you care. And so much of what drives my classroom is those, those relationships that are developed and that are furthered through things like music. Music is just the vehicle. Uh, I hate that this school year ended because on the last day of school, I tell my eighth graders, the joke was on you. And they kind of look at me kind of funny and I explain to them, it was never about music. Because as an educator, if I'm teaching so heartedly just to create future musicians, I'm going to be the most depressed guy in the world because the numbers just don't add up. All of these kids I'm going to teach are not going to go on to be professional musicians more than likely. No more than that coach that coaches the football team can expect all of his players to go to the NFL. But if I can teach some life lessons, if I can give you an appreciation for the art form, if I can give you a window into who you are, into yourself, then we've done something powerful. And that, I believe that's the thing that has gotten people through this, this pandemic because music is a mirror. It's a window into something greater that we can't always communicate, that we can't always understand or appreciate until we experience it itself. I call music the essential element. So now that we're on the other side of this, this COVID crisis, uh, to take a word from Ian, I see music, I see technology in particular as a tool, as a resource. And I think far too many times we put the cart in front of the horse. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see the technology as being a replacement of teachers, as some people may fear with these courses and different things. But I see it uh, serving as a powerful extension of that relationship that I spoke about earlier. So what I'm, what I'm striving to do now in this season is I'm having opportunities, amazingly. I think I've been more busy uh, being, being off work than I have been at work because now I have opportunities to go into music education courses and classes at universities to speak to school districts and my mission now is to change the lives of teachers and students everywhere by showing them that what you do is an art form. Teaching is an art form. Teaching, much like music, creates what I call a sound. And, and your sound when you teach is your passion, it's your purpose, it's your unique personal significance. And when we can tap into that, then I can put a video on and it gets a thousand views because it's not about the video, it's not about the subject matter. It's about that person that's showing that young person that they matter. So when we can do this beautiful blending of the person and the tools, as we talked about before, I think we create a highly effective platform that's going to have just unprecedented, uh, you know, ex out unexpected and unprecedented outcomes in the future. It's just a matter of, of navigating it in these next few weeks, months, and, and, and even years to make the most out of this thing. Right. That, that's great. Thank you. Um, Robin, as an engineer and a producer and someone who's been working with technology for as long as you have, I know that even before we entered these strange times, I think there should be a new drinking game. Drink every time you hear the words uncharted territory, challenging times. So you can all choose a beverage of your choice. So Robin, how do you see the technical world adapting? I know there's a lot that has happened technologically even before coronavirus. So I'm curious to your perspective as to where we are now and more importantly, where are we when we look ahead? Um, I think from, from, from a technological point of view, I think one of the obstacles I'm seeing at the moment is, is the, um, the quality of audio versus latency. And, and like, for example, having a Zoom call with multiple people being on Wi-Fi keeping that engagement, like the, the higher quality audio you can have and, and the way you can communicate, the more you're going to keep people engaged. So I, I definitely see like we've been doing streaming like recently to like a, a group of like three, 400 people and, and it's been amazing, but trying to especially cater to a bigger group and trying to get people in, uh, engaged is definitely uh, a struggle for for the technology field because we're trying to do a lot of things, but we are limited by what we can currently do. So uh, I'm hoping that 
things kind of will evolve in, in, in the more so that we can keep people engaged because I, I totally agree with uh, what, what has been said before. I think this is all a relationship based um, concept, well not a concept, but it, it's about relationships. It's about creating this role between the teacher and the student and by guiding them, understanding their problems and, and figure out for each person how to develop their own sound and their uniqueness uh, as an artist. And, and like, I think from technology, we can definitely still evolve in, in making that communication easier and, and more stable. And um, yeah. Right now, I, I, I definitely agree with what you said. I know for myself as a teacher, it's uniquely challenging to try and engage a large room of students. So much of what we do is personal. It's mm -hmm. professional, but, but music by definition has a personal context to it. There's magic, there's a mystique about it. It's sometimes difficult to convey that across a Zoom screen and to get people engaged. I think the subject matter is more compelling than most, but the ability to do it across the miles is, is, is difficult. So, Sean, you're a frontline worker as a musician, and so much of what musicians do is about being in the room where it happens. What's this experience been like for you, and how do you see your role in reaching up-and-coming musicians in the times ahead? Okay, well, I'll address the, uh, the role in reaching since this is a teaching thing. I'll go there first. <clears throat> so as, as a wise person, you know, notice what I said, it? as a more wise person <laughs> slash older guy, um, I, feel, I feel an innate responsibility to reach out to the younger people who haven't really embraced technology like they should have. Because I realized from watching this thing go from, you know, the last 30 years of, of the musical landscape, I've watched it go from, you know, just being a total hands-on thing to the internet, to the, to the fact that the internet is the major source of consumption. So um, I'm reaching out to all of these, pop, all of these guys who are band leaders and, and uh, content makers, and I'm trying to help them after I go and research and learn how to do it. I go and try to teach them how to do it because they have to, well, they don't have to, but they should choose to learn how to thrive in this, in, in this landscape because it's not going anywhere. So I've been reaching out to them personally. And after I do my lives or, or my, um, the things that I do on the internet, they call and they go, well, how'd you get that sound that way? Well, how'd you do this? And so then I'll have a whole session with them where I, you know, show them how to do it. But it was because I understood and I can see the trend I was like, I got to figure this out. So I took like three days to figure it out. So I go from um, when I, I do my all things music. Oh, I'm sorry. I do my all things music interview thing where I interview people in the music business. And that's a thing where I go from Zoom to OBS to Restreamer. But then whenever I do music, if you go through Zoom, Zoom is real tricky on the audio. So you have to go through Restreamer to get good audio because you don't have to worry about it distorting at, 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 a, at a minimal level. So then you go from OBS to Restreamer. So that was the first thing. Now, what was the first part of your question? <laughs> how am I doing? Yes. Yeah, well, how are you doing? And, and maybe we can pivot a little bit from that. What you're saying is very inspiring. So how do you see things shifting after we get back to, as you yourself put it in the chat, not back to normal, but back to a newer normal? Because right. whether it's God willing, weeks or months from now, or 12 to 18 months from now, what, whatever it is, this too shall pass. None of us know exactly when, but there is going to be another other side. And music is eternal. I always say that music is like food and air and water. It's a primal need. People will always need music. And even though the economic model may change and the technological methods may change, we're all still going to need to consume music and many of us to make music as well. So I'll start with you, Sean. Where do you see things going once we get to the other side of this? Okay, so it's two-sided. The beautiful thing is that music and entertainment in times of, of, of sorrow and stress and lack are always something that people put a premium on. Even in the Great Depression, things that thrive was music and alcohol. <laughs> entertainment and places and venues where they go that thrive. So the good news is if we can figure out how to, how to present our product to people, we will be okay. The bad news is, is this is a thinning of the herd. 
This is a purging of the herd. If you have to adapt or die, that phrase has never been more pertinent to us as musicians and people in the music industry than now. Um, you have to learn this, this landscape as best as you can. And, you know, and, and most people like me who are going to be on a budget, I don't have a big tech team. It's me. I'm, I'm waiting on my people to come and they're coming. But until they come, <laughs> I have got to do it. And, you know, you learn it and then you just, you just study and you get with all the people in all of these tech rooms who are creating these great platforms for us to use to get into different people's homes and on their phones. And we just got to figure out how to thrive. The biggest thing, like I'm telling everybody I come in contact with, is this. Learn this landscape. Learn it. Learn it. Use it. Practice. Right now, the good news is if you fail, everybody's forgiving. The, so, but they won't be forgiving long. <laughs> okay, well, that's very encouraging. I'm going to have to write that one down. How about you, Ian? I, I see you sort of nodding furiously as Sean is speaking. What's your take on this? Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, everyone, I, I agree with what everyone says, which is kind of boring. But, um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, for, for, I think the challenges for education um, are significant um, because it is a relationship thing as you know uh, Mickey um, so eloquently put it and as you yourself mentioned and I think um, figuring out how to um, create space to forge relationships through even while having online tools and while, while using online tools is going to be uh, is going to be really important and really paramount. And, and um, so I, I applaud everyone who's kind of like doing, doing that work and, and supporting people and doing that work, you know. Um, I, think, uh, uh, I think for musicians themselves, I mean, it's just like, I just want to go to a concert. Um, so my hope is like, you know, that when, when this thing passes, like we just, you know, maybe we start with smaller concerts. I love small concerts. I'm totally down for that as well, you know? Um, so maybe we can start going to like, you know, uh, you, you go to big concert halls and you're sitting like, you know, six feet apart from everyone, but it's like this nice coffee house vibe or something. Um, my advice for musicians at the moment, um, you know, at SoundFly we work with a lot of kind of DIY musicians, independent musicians, stuff like that, is, is, is to use this time to, to get in, to practice that skill of creating a lot of content. Because I think in the, you know, one thing we've, we've learned about like this digital world for musicians is that, you know, you, you build an audience on the internet by consistently producing great content and um uh and and you just push push that out push that out push that out push that out and this is really an opportunity to give yourself practice at that you know to just get in the habit of publishing something each week or like get in the ha habit of publishing something every two weeks or whatever it is um so uh so that's kind of my advice that that i'm often giving to musicians for taking advantage of this but uh but yeah, we're in a learning moment. Uh, so us people who care about learning, uh, we're all fired up uh, because this is this is a moment where we all uh, we all need to learn and we need to learn together. And, and uh, so so yeah, who knows? Who knows what it'll look like in a year? Absolutely, absolutely. By the way, we have a few minutes left, so if people have questions, if you want to throw them into the chat window, we'll tr we'll try and get to them. Robin, coronavirus aside, and I think. That's something I want to remind myself and everybody that, yes, while this is an ever-present topic, there was life before and there certainly will be life after. I'm curious as to some of the techniques that you're developing, have been working with both as an engineer and as an educator. What are some things that you see on the horizon in terms of being able to reach people and teach people and move forward? Um, I mean, obviously, besides the, the obvious streaming, streaming content, one of the things we've been doing is offering um, to everybody in the world, like personal feedback sessions. So we've gathered with people all around the world, like engineers such as Dave Pensado and, and people from Abbey Road to listen to people's music and give feedback because I, I honestly feel that it's such an important topic and I would encourage any aspiring artist to try to find a mentor, somebody you know, whose work you love, whose values you appreciate, and, and figure out uh, a relationship. And, and that's something we're trying to do in a way that's scalable, where people can submit a song, they ask feedback from either a songwriter, engineer, producer, 
and then we give feedback via voice notes, which is just really easy to do because we can listen to it and you know give encouraging feedback. Uh, and that's definitely something that, that I want to develop further just to be able to help people because people can make music at, in their homes, but being able to get feedback on what you're doing, I think that's something that's very valuable and I would love to explore that more. Great, I see Mickey, I see you nodding along. So let's not talk about the pandemic for a minute. So tell me what you have planned in the coming year, just in terms of your plans with your own students and how you intend to use your platform as educator of the year to try and reach people and teach people and help us connect. You know, um, uh, this year, is, I, I see it being a very powerful year for, for our country, for our profession. And for me personally, um, I'm reminded that statistically, I'm not supposed to be here. I came from a, what I call a forgotten community. Uh, matter of fact, the town I grew up in, they bulldozed the whole place, doesn't even exist anymore. But out of that forgotten community came a fellow that's able to now stand on phenomenal stages. And I use that to share with my students the idea that anything is possible. And I want to use that platform this year to show educators and students alike that there's another level to this, that there's another sphere of, of possibility and opportunity. And to see each and every day as an opportunity, because every opportunity is another opportunity for another opportunity. So the key is, as I was teaching my daughter how to drive this week on the interstate, and she was freaking out. I had to explain to her that, that even though the traffic is fast and it feels a little overwhelming, you've got to look for the signs. And the signs I believe we need to look for in this season are either exits or nextits. And for so many people, they're going to take that exit because they're going to be like, I'm tapping out like Sean said earlier, this is too much. But for the folks that can see the next, the opportunity, the nextit, I think that that's where, that's where the success is going to lie. So for me as a teacher, um, I believe our success lies in stages and what's behind the stage. So my mission right now, again, is to change the lives of students and teachers everywhere through this beautiful me medium called music. And for teachers, I want them to sh understand that their teaching is very much like me when I'm on the stage of my saxophone, that we're performing, that is a stage, and to treat teaching like the art form it is, and how there are small things that can be done well, stacked on top of each other over time, that can ultimately create this process that can be admired by many. And I have a program called Sound 180 Educators that I've been piloting in different colleges and universities around the country and other school districts. And now I'm using this COVID rest, so to speak, to uh, provide my services for educators. So we have a cohort that's meeting next week and we're gonna use this opportunity to just uplift and, and, and bolster our educators so that when we come back to this new normal, they're more equipped, they're better equipped, they're well equipped to win. And as Sean's doing with his show, All, All Things Music, uh, if anybody hadn't had a chance to check it out yet, I, I, I recommend it. I, I, I endorse it because what he does is he brings in artists and he shows you what happens behind the scenes. You know, those little things, what do artists do right before they go on stage? What's their thought process? And I want to use technology in this season to teach a fine arts survey or a music appreciation class. But now more than ever, because we have the availability, reach out to some of these artists because now that everybody is more comfortable with the Zoom process or you know, these different multimedia um, techniques and devices, I think we can bring our communities closer together in a way we've never had before. So this community is gonna be so powerful if we keep on going. That's what I mean when I say we're better together when we band together. Amen, brother. Well, I've, I've just gotten the word from Melissa, who for the record is one of my favorite people in the world as well. And I wanna really shout out Melissa and uh, Brian and Shoshana for putting this whole event together in short order under very, very challenging circumstances. Uh, it's easy to do under the best of circumstances. To do it like this is, is no small feat. So thank you guys for doing it. I'm really honored to have been a part of it. Thank you very, very much to the speakers. And just kind of a final note for me when I think about teaching, I know for me, I learn more from my students than I think they learn from me. And so for everyone who either is an educator or, you know, that old saying, each one teach one. I think we're all teachers in our way. And I think music is the glue that is holding a lot together. So I just encourage everyone to think about all of these opportunities to educate someone else. And when you're teaching somebody else, think about what you can learn in the process. So uh, I gather there's going to be a breakout room. You're all welcome yeah. to 
join me there for a beverage of your choice. Mine is just coffee, but you know, it's early. So thank you all again to the speakers. Thank you so much for being here. Be safe, be healthy, eat chocolate, and peace out.